It's actually gorgeous. Okay. Um, welcome to the um, first case on the afternoon session of the Kansas Court of Appeals. I'm Karen Arnoldberger, Chief Judge of the Court. I'll be presiding today, which simply, simply means I'll be your timekeeper. To my right is Judge Henry Green, who hails from Leavenworth and is the longest serving member of our court at 28 years. Um, to my left is Judge Michael B. Boozer um, from Overland Park, and he's been on our court 16 years. So I'm the baby of the group with only 11 years, but I think um, we have enough experience to handle your case today and um, hopefully um, uh, figure out the issues involved. Uh, I'm going to call the case in just a minute, but I will let you know that you'll each have, of course, 15 minutes. Um, the appellant, when you announce your appearance, if you'll let me know how much time you want to reserve for rebuttal. Also, because we are um, on YouTube and people may um, watch this video, um, I will allow the appellant two minutes extra time at the beginning just to give an overview of the case for people watching so they'll generally know what this case is about that I won't count towards your 15 minutes. So with that, I'm gonna call uh, case 122980, Creative Consumer Concepts and Robert S. Cutler versus Kansas Department of Labor and Stanton D. Barker. The parties will state their appearances, please. I am Julie Gibson and I'm here for the appellant, Creative Consumer Concepts, otherwise known as C3. So I'll refer to it as C3 throughout the, okay, the argument. And may it please the court, the appellee, uh, Stanton D. Barker, who goes by Dan traditionally, appears by his counsel, Adam Hall, by Zoom. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Gibson, I'm sorry, did you say how much time you wanted in rebuttal? I didn't. Um, uh, 12 and 3, please. 12 and 3. Okay, um, you can go ahead and get started. Thank you, Your Honor. This is one of those cases, this, this case involves a wage claim um, made by uh, Mr. Barker at, um, after he was, he resigned employment from C3 um, for commissions on sales that occurred after his employment ended. This is one of those cases where the agency decision should be reversed for a second time. <laughs> this court has heard this case once before um, different panel, and, it looks like. Di yes, different panel. Yes. In 2016, you issued the first opinion, uh, which I'll call Barker One. Mm -hmm. um, and this second time on appeal, um, we think that the that at least it should be reversed in part, if not all, um, because at least five of the 26 accounts on which commissions were awarded by the ALJ <laughs> There are, uh, Mr. Barker did not meet his burden of proof as established under the Barker one case and the, the applicable statute, which is KSA 77-621 section D. The judgment therefore is not supported by the sufficient evidence that Mr. Barker um, contacted, screened and delivered sales leads to a C3 sales representative that actually ripened into sales on which he would earn commissions. Um, and I think you will agree when you consider, as, uh, as you must, the record as a whole, um, including the detracting evidence, that's the word from the statute, the detracting evidence as required under 77-621D, which evidence the ALJ did not consider or discuss in his opinion. And I think, and I hope when you consider that evidence that you'll agree with me, and if you do, then um, the judgment must be reduced by the principal amount of $107,617.23 plus interest, which as of today, that amount is about $165,000. And I'm embarrassed to say that in the prayer for relief in my brief, um, I used a $97,000 number and that's not correct. Um, when you add up the five accounts that, that we are asking the court to reverse, it it adds up to the $107,617 number. So I just want to get that out there. Um, $107,617.23. What? $107, okay. Thank you. Um, so let me back up for just a, a minute or two before I look at each of these five accounts and, and talk about the evidence. The, as I indicated, Mr. Barker was employed from 2009 to August of 2012 by 
by my client, C3. He made this wage claim after he resigned from his employment for commissions on sales that didn't uh, weren't actually made until after he left, sometimes three, three and a half years after he left. C3 took the position that those that that under their commission agreement, those uh, commissions weren't owed on sales that were made after he left. The Department of Labor agreed with that. That was appealed to the Shawnee District Court. Shawnee District Court agreed with that. That was appealed to your court and you disagreed mm -hmm. and said, yes, um, by virtue of the kind of job that he had, um, once he contact screened and delivered um, to a C3 sales representative, these leads that he developed, then he's done his job. And if, if those leads then develop into actual sales, he's earned his commissions and it doesn't matter whether those sales actually were consummated while he was employed or after. So um, was that decision appealed? Um, I believe the petition there, for review filed or I think so, but I don't think it didn't go any further than your court. Okay. So, um, so that was remanded and mm -hmm. um, back to the ALJ, uh, the, the, the KDOL for further proceedings to figure out how much was owed on these accounts and, and if, if he'd earned these particular accounts. Mm -hmm. um, and I say the, um, there's been confusion both on appeal and in the district court about what your opinion meant. Um, mm -hmm. Mr. Barker took the position that there's some language in there that talks about in every instance, the accounts, the, the um, commissions were earned, meaning it meant that for every account that he's claiming um, commissions, um, all, all that had to be determined was how much. Um, I don't think that's, uh, you're obviously in the best position to determine what your opinion says and means, but I don't think that's what the language says. And that's not the issue that was before the court at that time. Um, the, the language I think is taken out of context. And if you look at the actual language, whenever that position is cited in the briefing um, that it meant that he had earned his commissions in every instance, I think the preceding sentence was left out of that, um, of that uh, concept. The actual language is, and if a given lead Barker developed never ripened into actual sales, he wound up earning a commission of zero, but in every instance, Barker had done the required work and thus earned compensation under the agreement. That some of the commissions would be computed only after Barker left his employment with C3 doesn't mean he failed to earn them. So there's this concept that there must be a link between the leads that he developed, that he delivers to a C3 sales representative and the actual sales. So that that's what was litigated when it went back to the Kansas Department of Labor the ALJ understood that there was discussion about that on the record. I don't think so that concept sort of got skewed up when it made it back to the court, to the um, district court and then on appeal. So I, I don't think there was any confusion by the ALJ as to what your opinion meant and, and that there's this concept that it must be connected. In any event, um, on remand, there were 26 accounts that were at issue and um, that's, that the parties started out disputing. There was discovery done. There was a house report that was ordered. It was essentially an audit of all these 26 accounts. By the time we got to the hearing, um, that number had been reduced to 15 that were still in dispute. Somewhere along the line, my client decided there were about six accounts that he actually owed. Uh, they actually owed the money on and they paid that. They were ordered to pay about 14 grand. Um, but as of the hearing, there were 15 left. After the hearing, the ALJ decided that on five of those accounts, Mr. Barker hadn't earned his commission. There were different reasons for that. Some, um, he didn't deliver it to a C4, C3 sales rep. He delivered his contacts to a, uh, to a different entity. So that wasn't within, he didn't earn commissions on that. Uh, on a couple of them, they were for design services that didn't fall within the commission agreement. So he didn't earn commissions on those. So five of them, he didn't earn commissions and the ALJ found that on those five, he didn't, and that's not been appealed. On 10, the last 10 accounts, the ALJ determined that Mr. Barker put on sufficient evidence and awarded him 156,000 and change for those. Um, we say of those five of them, the detracting evidence that wasn't considered, um, 
cuts off, <laughs> um, it makes it so that the uh, evidence was not sufficient to support the judgment on those five accounts. And here's here's the the statute was amended in 2009, and and what Judge Lieben said in the case Herrera Gallegos versus H and H Delivery Service, and that case is um, that this quote is reproduced in a case a more recent case Phelps versus Kansas Employment um, 261 Pacific Third 979 um, from 2011. Uh, this is what he says about that standard. But the reason I, I don't think I cited that Phelps case in my brief, and I think that one's important because that's one in which this court determined that the agency's opinion was not supported by the evidence. And those are um, those are somewhat hard to come by because the agency often gets, um, gets it right, but this time they didn't. Anyway, the, the standard is when the Court of Appeals assesses whether the evidence is substantial enough to support those findings, uh, the appellate court must now determine whether the evidence supporting the agency's decision has been so undermined by cross-examination or other evidence that it, it is insufficient to support the agency's conclusion. So it has to look at that detracting evidence too, not just the supporting evidence. And when I think, and, and I think when you do that, um, there's no evidence. Um, when you look at the, the evidence, the documentary evidence that C3 supported on these five accounts that, that um, on which you can connect his lead to the actual sale. So that, that's where they fall short. Now on those other five, the reason why we haven't focused on those in our brief is because quite frankly, we don't have the same kind of detracting evidence. We don't have an email that clearly says a relationship was terminated after Barker's contacts and somebody else resurrected the relationship and, and secured, excuse me, secured the sale. Whereas on these five, we do. So arguably, the agency's decision, if it's just Barker's testimony that he contacted, screened, and delivered those accounts, if there's nothing between that and a sale, then I suppose um, it's fair to say that there was sufficient evidence to support those five. On the other hand, the other five, that's not the case. And those five accounts are Denny's, Payway, Texas Roadhouse, and um, oops, here. Captain D's, and IHOP or Applebee's. Those add up to the 107,000 number, if, if, if you agree with me on all of those. And I, I don't know if I have time to go through all of them, but I, I'll, I'll talk about one or two of them. And, and um, if you wanna go back and out, talk about any of them, we can. Payway is a great example, for example, of detracting evidence that puts a pretty hard stop on um, what Mr. Barker did and the actual sale. So three years after Mr. Barker resigned from C3, Jennifer Lopez at C3 was emailing with a guy named Clay Dover who had worked at C3 before, um, before he went off and did other things. So he was looking for a new job and in the I just I just want to let you know, Ms. Gibson, yeah. you only have two minutes left. If you're going to try to go through each one of these, I don't think you're going to have time to do that. Yeah, I, I won't do that. <laughs> yeah, I certainly won't. I certainly won't do that. I think our brief sets those out and puts the, the evidence right in there. So I think you can I, I have every confidence that 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 mm -hmm. you'll be able to. So you've OK, so if I understand this right, the ones that are in dispute for this appeal where you believe that there was enough detracting Ooh. evidence to overcome the evidence presented was Denny's, Payway, Texas Roadhouse, Captain D's, and IHOP slash Applebee's. Correct. Right. Those are the ones we're focusing on. Okay. Correct. Yeah. And um, and I think all of them have good examples of a hard, kind of a hard stop between what Mr. Barker did and then what somebody else did that directly connects up with the actual sale. And I think, I think um, since I'm limited with time, I think I'll hop right to the, the last issue and let uh, unless you have a question about any of those particular five accounts. Um, the, the, the last issue was that the ALJ held Mr. Cutler, who's a principal at C3, personally liable mm -hmm. for, um, for, for these wages. And that was an inconsistent finding. And, and I don't think he, there's not a sufficient, um, there's not sufficient evidence or a finding that Mr. Cutler knowingly allowed C3 to violate the statute um, in light of his 
holding that there was no willful or knowing um, violation of the statute enough to impose the penalty under a separate statute. Um, that, that this was always in dispute. When the, the ones that weren't in dispute, C3 paid up front on remand, right? The six, um, the $14,000 payment. From that, everything until the hearing was in dispute, whether it was owed at all or the amount. So it's very diff, I don't, it, it makes no sense to find that he knowingly permitted violation of the statute when he didn't have any uh, information about how much he needed to pay or should pay or that he even owed it because that was always in dispute. So I think holding him personally liable, and, and this is what we argued in the brief and cited some really good cases, um, when there's a good faith belief that, that those amounts are not Okay, owed. so let me get this straight. So that in Barker 1, the district, the ALJ and the district court both agreed that he didn't know those amounts, correct? correct. And we reversed that. Correct. And on remand now, the district court has found that he willfully failed to pay amounts owing. No, cr uh, no. Cutler. And so he um, is personally liable. No, no, um, not quite right. Okay. There were two findings. There's a there's a penalty that's imposed on the company for some okay. additional amounts if it's willful and knowing. And right. he found that evidence didn't exist because he was the KDOL found agreed with him and right. the district court right. agreed with him and everything was in dispute all the way up until the time right. of the hearing. Right. Right. So there was no knowing or willful violation to impose the penalty under the statute. Right. But he then said under the, a different section, Cutler knowing Cutler with knowledge of all the facts didn't make the payment and therefore he's personally liable for the payment. And the case say that Travis case that we cite um, cites another Kansas. That's a that's a federal district court case, but but it actually but it relies on an, a Kansas appellate court opinion called Erdman um, for the notion that a good faith belief that there's a dispute as to the, the, whether you owe it or not. Um, so the inconsistency like, is the fact that he, they didn't assess penalties. Um, but they did find, uh, because it wasn't willful, but they did find willful violations to find Cutler personally liable. They, they found knowing this, the, the language is or a little knowing, different. Yeah. It's willful for the, for, willful and knowing for the penalties and then it's right. knowing for the, for the personal liability. And okay, the question is, what does that knowingly mean? Okay. Yeah. Is there, are there any other questions from the panel? I'm sorry, your time is up for your primary Thank you. argument. No. Okay, Mr. Hall, you want to go ahead and I'll come, I'll give you your three minutes, Ms. Gibson, when we get back. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Hall. Yes, may it please the court. Uh, this court should affirm the decision of the Department of Labor uh, because Stanton Barker is entitled to the wages and in this form of commissions uh, that he earned while employed at Creative Consumer Concepts. And on remand, following the decision in what Ms. Gibson calls, I think appropriately, Barker won. Uh, Mr. Barker took the witness stand and proved uh, that he had earned those wages, uh, despite the fact that the mandate uh, from this court indicated that there was no dispute between the parties that that was the case. The findings of the administrative law judge note the consistency of the factual findings made before him at the time of hearing with the mandate of this court. Mr. Barker uh, took the witness stand uh, when he did that at the time of the formal hearing in October of 2018, the administrative law judge made a number of observations in his ultimate opinion. Uh, the administrative law judge noted that the fact that Mr. Barker had taken the stand, had subjected himself to cross-examination, had taken an oath, and had testified expressly and unequivocally that with respect to each of the accounts to which he claimed uh, wage in the form of a commission. He had done the work uh, it identified by the administrative law judge as being necessary to entitle him to a commission. Mr. Barker and the other witnesses that he called at the hearing also uh, discussed the nature of the business of creative consumer concepts, how different uh, accounts were scouted, how those accounts came to generate profits uh, for creative consumer concepts and what their various roles were in getting what would be ultimately a, a new business prospect 
to be an account that there would be sales uh, ultimately to at, create, uh, at Creative Consumer Concepts. Uh, the, what is not challenged and what I think is very material before this court are three findings by the administrative law judge, uh, which are contained at record volume five, page 27. Uh, their findings, I'm sorry, four findings, findings 20 through 23. So the, the premise, it seems, of Creative Consumer Concepts Appeal is, well, Mr. Barker's entitlement to these uh, wages, these commissions should be cut off uh, by a contractual condition subsequent or contractual term. Basically, if he scouts the business, does the work required of him, but some other employee either contributes to or uh, their work uh, establishes the relationship then Mr. Barker is not entitled to a commission. Uh, well, the administrative law judge heard evidence regarding the party's course of performance on their contract and read the contract itself, make, making findings that are uncontested in the course of this appeal. And those findings, I think, are determinative of the appeal before the court. The administrative law judge found in, in finding 20 at, uh, again, record volume five, page 27, that the parties had no agreement that the claimant, Mr. Barker's, earning of a commission was contingent upon him being the sole person to make contact with or screen that given prospect, nor was there any agreement that the claimant's related efforts must be primary, instrumental, notable, or proximate cause of any sales resulting from the prospect. The administrative law judge also found that the parties had no agreement that claimant's earning of a commission was contingent on him being the first person to make contact with or screen that given prospect. May, and the administrative law judge found the parties had no agreement that the claimant was precluded from earning a commission on any prospect that had previously purchased goods from the respondent. Finally, uh, the administrative law judge found that the claimant, his witnesses, and his supporting documentation and evidence describe a pervasive workplace environment in which a very high degree of fluid collaboration between employees took place regarding the contacting and screening of business prospects. Respondent submitted no contrary evidence on this point. And those findings I think are important in the context of what is uh, offered by C3 and uh, Robert Cutler as detracting evidence. Uh, the, the, the problem is they presume the existence of a condition proceeding within the contract, which would divest Mr. Barker um, and create a forfeiture of his wage in the event that another employee took part in uh, creating the contact that led to sales. And the, 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 the problem is that Creative Consumer con uh, Concepts ignores that the administrative law judge considered the issue and expressly decided that the contract does not contain such a provision that would uh, create a divesture of Mr. Barker's wage once earned, uh, which again, Mr. Barker testified with corroborating witnesses and other corroborating documentation that he had done. So for that reason, the, the, the argument itself that these emails, uh, again, not emails that were uh, business records, just emails without any additional foundation evidence uh, that have no relevance uh, ultimately to the question of whether or not Mr. Barker had earned his commission because they don't tend to suggest that Mr. Barker had not in fact labored in the way that he testified that he did and in which his uh, supporting documentation of witnesses uh, indicated that he did. They just tended to establish that a future fact a fact which is claimed by C3 to have created a divesture which does not exist within the contract uh, as written or as uh, performed by the parties in the course of their employment relationship. Mr. Hall, uh, let, me, let me ask you a hypothetical question. If, you're, if Mr. Barker went up while he was employed, went up to Chipotle, introduced himself to the manager of Chipotle and say, we got some great things, little toys for children. That we'd like you to purchase as part of a promotion for Chipotle. And then he left the company. And then two years later, someone else went up to Chipotle and said, we've got little toys with children that we think would be really neat for Chipotle. And they sign a 
$50,000 contract for those toys. Under your interpretation of the contractual provisions, would Mr. Barker have earned, should he have earned a commission on that sale? If Mr. Barker did what the parties contracted for, which is to contact screen and deliver, and the, the administrative law judge went through an analysis of exactly what that means. Contact doesn't mean go to the restaurant and, and uh, have dinner there on one occasion. It, it requires a contact with someone with some decision-making authority for the corporation. The administrative law judge looked at all of these potential factors, all the arguments made by both parties with respect to the meaning of uh, those terms within the party's employment agreement and decided that Mr. Barker, based on his testimony and the testimony of the witnesses and documents that he offered, uh, were sufficient under the, the facts presented to the administrative law judge to satisfy those requirements. In your hypothetical, I think, I think C3 would have a pretty good case to suggest that talking to one employee at uh, one Chipotle franchise does not qualify sufficiently uh, for Mr. Barker to have earned that commission. But that is not the evidence before the administrative law judge that's now being reviewed by this court. Instead, Mr. Barker what's, said he talked to some high level folks. What's the meaning? What's the meaning of the word delivery? So the meaning of the word delivery was ultimately determined by the the administrative law judge to mean that Mr. Barker delivered the the contact basically to an individual within C3 who had some authority. Um, and I'm unfortunately, I'm trying to do this on the fly, but there is an appropriate finding by the administrative law judge as to the meaning of delivery. Uh, a, a, a conclusion, a finding that is not challenged by creative consumer concepts on this appeal and that the administrative law judge found was satisfied by the evidence offered by the claimant, Mr. Barker, uh, below. The, the second question, so, so setting aside the contractual issues, well, was there a sufficiently uh, a contractual term which would allow the divestiture of Mr. Barker uh, and his uh, potential commission? Setting that to the side, I think also the administrative law judge very well could have uh, disregarded the evidence offered by creative consumer concepts as being insufficiently persuasive to overcome the evidence offered by the claimant, Mr. Barker, even if the administrative law judge had interpreted the contract in the way uh, that creative consumer concepts wanted it to. Uh, because the evidence offered by Mr. Barker was the kind of evidence that we would normally expect in a court of law, live testimony, witnesses, subject to cross-examination, who can be observed by the finder of fact and their, the way that they present their evidence, the way they talk, in addition to uh, the actual words that are uttered from their mouth, which are very important in the fact-finding context. Uh, both Mr. Barker and the witnesses that he called uh, were available uh, in that way, except for one witness that he called by telephone. Mr. Barker also offered business records, contemporaneous documents that have a special significance within the law uh, created by him prior to the initiation of litigation uh, for the purpose of documenting the efforts about which he testified at the time of hearing, tending to establish the authenticity of his testimony and its credibility. In contrast, uh, the administrative law judge noted at the beginning of his uh, opinion, the initial order following remand, that creative consumer concepts had appeared by its uh, appointed representative, which was Mr. Cutler at the time of hearing. Uh, the uh, respondent creative consumer concepts gave notice that it would be calling two witnesses, including Ms. Loper, who Ms. Gibson had just discussed, you know, being the source of these emails. Uh, that are alleged to be uh, the, the evidence which tends to disenfranchise Mr. Barker from his um, wage. And even though those witnesses were noticed, uh, telephone uh, was available, they could testify remotely, they were given permission to testify remotely, Creative Consumer Concepts chose not to call those witnesses. Uh, the fact finder, of course, is left to wonder why that was the case. And we have cited the court to the case, which indicates the sort of unextraordinary evidentiary principle that when facts are uniquely within one party's um, possession, the failure to offer those facts, to cast light 
upon an issue which otherwise is unclear or ambiguous before the fact finder, uh, a presumption is created. The presumption that that evidence would have been harmful to the party who was in its exclusive possession. And I think very reasonably, uh, the administrative law judge did not choose to find that the emails offered by creative consumer concepts uh, were more persuasive than the business records and sworn checked and cross-examined testimony offered by the claimant in this case. Uh, I don't think that Ms. Uh, Gibson's stated standard could be met by the emails offered by creative consumer concepts at hearing. That is those Mr. emails. Paul, you're um, almost, uh, you've got about three more minutes of time left. And I wanted to get to this second issue of um, Cutler's personal responsibility for um, these payments. And my question is, and maybe maybe it's Ms. Gibson that I should ask this, uh, but was there any evidence presented about what the normal practice in the um, sales community is with regards to paying commissions after someone leaves employment? I understand we have the contract provision and what that said, but as far as whether Mr. Cutler was acting knowingly, was there any kind of testimony about what the common practice is in the sales industry with regards to commissions? There was no testimony as to the common practice for other businesses uh, mm -hmm. with respect to payment of commissions after the end of employment. Obviously, you've got the Wage Payment Act, which demands right. Uh, right. payment of wages within a certain period of time after the termination of the employment agreement. Uh, but I think there was adequate evidence within the record to support the finding of the administrative law judge with respect to the knowing uh, violation. Okay, of just one more question. Was there any evidence about then in the case of creative concepts, whether how they had treated employees in the past who had left and still may have commissions owing? No, you're No. OK. All right. That's it. Thank you. But I do think, uh, as I was indicating previously, that there is adequate evidence. The administrative law judge uh, specifically found that after this court issued its decision in 2016, the decision by uh, Cutler not to pay any wages, despite the fact that he was full, he was the CEO of the corporation, fully in control of its ability to pay wages, was evidence that he was knowingly violating the act. In fact, Ms. Ms. Gibson mentioned that Mr. Cutler uh, admitted he owed $14,000 in wages and paid it. Well, that's not exactly accurate. He admitted uh, in a pleading before the administrative law judge's court that he owed $14,000 some dollars in wages after those wages were calculated. He appeared at a preliminary, uh, at a pre-hearing conference well, rather, uh, and reaffirmed that creative consumer concepts owed that money. Was he this was in Barker 1 or in Barker 2? On remand. On uh, remand, okay. He, after making that second admission, the administrative law judge ordered uh, Cutler to pay that amount to Mr. Barker, and Cutler attempted uh, to get the order set aside on the ground that he had mistakenly make that made that admission. And in the final order of the administrative law judge, a pre-hearing order, the administrative law judge said, your attempt to recant your fact pleading is a fact that I'm going to use in my consideration of your credibility at the time of hearing. You will pay that amount uh, to Mr. Barker. You've already admitted twice that that amount was owed. Uh, and of course, in this litigation, uh, the court uh, hears now that there was a challenge to the lawfulness of the proceedings below. And now I hear counsel for C3 and Mr. Cutler indicating that only five of the accounts are subject to detracting evidence and that the claim of error is limited to those accounts. The, the question then sort of naturally arises, well, was there an offer by C3 or Cutler to pay the remaining amount to Mr. Barker? And the answer is no. Uh, I so, okay, even so if, I'm a little confused if you could help me here. So yeah. is the finding that Cutler owes this money personally based on his actions during Barker 2 or is it based on his actions at the time um, uh, Mr. Uh, Barker was leaving and he said, I'm not paying you anything. You're going to have to sue me or something to that effect. What is, is it based on that action or is it based on his, his uh, behavior in Barker too? 
it's and, and I appreciate uh, being reined in in that respect. So it is the finding of the administrative law judge is based on the actions of Mr. Cutler prior to uh, proceedings on remand. Basically, in 2016, once the decision of this court uh, was released and published, he should have known that he can no longer continue to stand on. The OK, read. so is it based on so it's based on not paying up in tw after Barker won? That, as I read the administrative law judge's opinion, that is correct. However, I think within the record, there's also other evidence which would support that finding. Uh, in, in addition to other evidence, uh, the administrative law judge was offered evidence of an arbitration entered into between, uh, by, initiated by Mr. Cutler, uh, accusing Mr. Barker of having stolen uh, C3 documents in connection with his wage claim. The arbitrator, whose entire opinion appears in the record and was considered by the administrative law judge, found that, in fact, um, Mr. Cutler had breached the party's wage payment agreement or, or employment agreement at the time of Mr. Barker's separation by re basically anticipatorily repudiating his obligation to pay any wages to Mr. Barker uh, in violation of law. And uh, I think that finding uh, would form the basis of a collateral estoppel or otherwise support the determination of the administrative law judge uh, that Mr. Barker or that Mr. Cutler had knowingly withheld wages in violation of the Wage Payment Act. Um, I, I'm, you're out of time now, and I've caused that to happen. I want to make sure that the, my other panel members don't have any questions. Yes, Jeff. If not, I'll give you like half a minute to close out. Mr. Hall. So uh, this wage that we're talking about was earned by Mr. Barker in 2012. He's a he's an individual guy. Uh, Creative Consumer Concepts is a multi-million dollar corporation. Its CEO has prevented Mr. Barker from earning that wage uh, for a very long period of time. We are asking uh, that this court affirm the wage claim determination made by the administrative law judge and affirmed uh, both below by the Department of Labor and the district court. We think that's the proper way for the court to proceed. Affirmance in whole. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Ms. Gibson, you have three minutes. Yeah, let me answer really quickly the, the, the question on the knowingly and the inconsistent findings. What what uh, to find him, to find Mr. Cutler personally liable, the statute requires um, uh, it, it will hold an officer liable who knowingly permits the employer to engage in violations of the wage payment, uh, wage uh, claim act. When he was ruling on the, uh, whether the penalty was going to be awarded or not, he says, the court of appeals made no ruling about any given amount of unpaid commissions, only declaring that some amount was certainly owed. Given this factual void from the court's reversal until now, at the hearing, right? The ALJ cannot find that respondent willfully and lawfully unlawfully withheld payment while such extensive data was still in discovery. Even the respondent's partial admission of $14,787 being owed was not achieved until after the scope of the defined order for production of the House report. And following this partial payment, there remained unresolved questions of fact. So the, the, the question here in determining whether he's personally liable or not is not, um, it, it is, I think that I think the undi I think it's undisputed that there were still questions of fact. There were still um, it was still unresolved. The question is, um, did he did he have a good faith belief? That's the standard. Did he have a good faith belief that there was still dispute as to how much was owed and whether it was owed on any particular account? And the answer is yes, and that's what the ALJ finds. And nobody's and and Mr. Barker hasn't appealed that finding. That's in paragraph fifteen of. Um, the ALJ's order. So those two findings are inconsistent as a matter of law <laughs> um, and as a matter of fact. So I think the question is, is this court going to apply the standard for that knowing for the holding the personally liable uh, statute? Is it going to hold that the uh, good that the st that the standard in the Travis case, the standard in the Erdman case, is what's going to apply. And I think the court, of course, will because that's the law. And um, and I think when you do that, 
there's no question there was a good faith belief by Mr. Cutler that there were disputes still owed. And that's what the ALJ says. So um, hopefully that answers the question. With respect to the, the hard stop, I, I just want to reiterate, reiterate, reiterate one more time. Um, I don't, C3 is not saying on appeal that, that Mr. Barker, Mr. Barker certainly testified that he contacted, screened, and delivered all of these accounts. What's missing from his testimony, what's missing from his witnesses is what happened after he left and what actually occurred to, to secure those, those uh, sales. And the, the, the question is, um, here is that remoteness in time and the fact that there's detracting evidence from C3, which by the way was admitted without, without um, objection at the hearing. It's evidence the court can, uh, can and this court should under the, the agency review statute consider. Um, is that explanatory evidence that puts a hard stop on Mr. Barker's conduct and says somebody else's was the reason why this was an actual sale. And, the, and we're not, nobody's saying that when, as a matter of practice, if um, somebody else's conduct uh, contributed to and added to Mr. Barker's context and that result in the sale, it didn't have to be the, he didn't have to be the sole cause. He couldn't have been, he had to deliver, once he delivered the contact to the sales representative, somebody else closed the deal. So always from the very beginning, it was always collaborative. That's not the point. The point is that it's that hard stop between what he did and then three years later what somebody else did that cuts that off and that at some point he can't get, continue to get uh, commissions based on sales resulting from somebody else's work. Um, and that's all I have, Your Honor. That's your, okay. Thank you very much. Any other questions from the panel? Okay. Thank you very much. We appreciate your argument. We'll take this matter under advisement and issue an opinion as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day.